good morning, Richfield Church of Christ, and any guests who are joining us online. My name is Ethan Bilbury, and I preach for the church here in Richfield, Minnesota. Thank you for being with us today. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 10. Uh, we're going to be starting verse 24 and going through chapter 11, verse 1 in our sermon today. Before we get into the text, I do want to just give you a reminder uh, that today uh, is Orphan Sunday. Uh, and what that means is our church, uh, we support a uh, organization called Orphans Lifeline of Hope. Uh, it's an organization connected with the Churches of Christ, and uh, they uh, support and work with orphanages uh, around the world, uh, helping children uh, receive care, education, a chance to learn the gospel and develop uh, into adults who will be able to serve in their communities. Uh, and we uh, support this in an ongoing basis, month to month. But every year, uh, they have what's called Orphan Sunday in the month of November. And it's on this Sunday that we give a special collection to this work. And so, uh, obviously, you're not here in person. Uh, but if you want to give a donation to Orf Orphan's Lifeline of Hope, you can send it to our, our church address at 7314 Humboldt Avenue South in Richfield, Minnesota, 55423. Uh, make out the check to Richfield Church of Christ, but put in the memo line, Orphan Sunday, uh, and we are going to send a collective uh, check to Orphan's Lifeline, or you're welcome to go online to their website, uh, and you can donate online there. Uh, but we are thankful for their work, and it, it is a reminder to us that part of what it means to be uh, pure in our religion, in our practice of following Jesus, is to care for orphans and widows, to visit them in their affliction, uh, to be concerned for their well-being. Uh, and we know that around the world, orphans and widows are often the most vulnerable populations to war, to famine, uh, to poverty in general, and to struggling just to live. And uh, so this is a way we can help with that. So I hope you'll be a part of that. Well, okay, we're going to get into our message now. Thanks for listening to that. I want you to think about growing up, who it was that you looked up to who it was that was a model or an example, uh, someone that you wanted to be like, you wanted to follow them, uh, to do things that they did, to do them the way that they did, to dress like they did, to do the work that they did. Uh, and I imagine that for many of you watching, there, there are a number of people that come to mind. Maybe it was your, your parents, your aunts and uncles, your grandparents, somebody in your family uh, that you looked up to and thought, man, if I could just be like them when I grow up, um, I'd be doing okay. Uh, or it may have been other adults in your life. Maybe it was teachers or coaches, uh, people that you worked for as you began to enter into the workforce as a teenager or young adult. Uh, maybe it was a college professor. Uh, maybe it was a minister or a preacher or some kind of other uh, spiritual leader, an elder, a uh, deacon, uh, their family, someone in your life, a youth minister, Someone in your life that made a difference, and you could think of all kinds of other areas of life where you maybe experienced what we often refer to as a mentor or a coach or an example to follow. Uh, I, I can think of so many uh, people. I, I think of my parents. I think of teachers. Uh, I think in particular of many um, spiritual leaders, whether it was uh, ministers growing up or youth ministers preachers, uh, missionaries, uh, Bible professors who had also served in ministry and were often serving in ministry even as they were teaching uh, those of us that wanted to become preachers, is that there are so many people who have had a positive, uh, formative effect on my life. And par part of that is that I saw in, in so many of them, none of them were perfect, but I saw in so many of them uh, what it meant to begin and to try to follow Jesus and reflect his image, to be conformed to his life in my own life, is that they were pointing to Christ with their lives and helping me see what would it look like for this to be lived out in my life? What, if, what would it look like for me to try to give my life in service to Jesus? And in truth, this is what it means to be a disciple, is that we are the people who want to become like Jesus, our teacher and master. And so in the Gospel of Matthew, where we are, as Matthew uh, continues to share with us this teaching that Jesus gave to the twelve that was for them, but also is continually for the church throughout the generations, is this is what it will look like for us to become like Christ, uh, in particular when we are carrying out his mission, his message, his ministry, and we face persecution, uh, that this is something to be expected. And, and how do we live out the life of Christ in our own lives, even when we face such opposition. 
And in this text that we're going to read together, we see some of the most famous words of Jesus that in order to be his disciple, yes, we become like him. Uh, but above all, we give God our allegiance. No other uh, priority in life takes our greatest allegiance. Only God deserves our full commitment, our full devotion, our ultimate priority, uh, our willingness to lay down our lives for Jesus and for his kingdom. Only God should be at the top of our priorities in life. And everything else must be submitted under that, uh, that Jesus is Lord. And so this text is going to remind us what does that look like and why should we be willing to make uh, whatever sacrifices must be made to follow Jesus in our lives. So let's read the, the whole text together, and then we're going to walk through it and hear what it has to say about what does it mean for us to follow Jesus. Matthew chapter 10, starting in verse 24, and I hope you'll grab a Bible and read there with me. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to sit a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet, because he is a prophet, will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person, because he is a righteous person, will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water, because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. When Jesus had finished instructing his disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me as we begin this morning? God, we come to you today uh, grateful for what Jesus has suffered for us in his death on the cross and his resurrection. We are grateful that he's been vindicated as the Messiah, the anointed king, come to save us from sin and death. Lord Jesus, thank you that you reign at God's right hand, that you intercede as our great high priest. And we come into the presence of God today to offer uh, honor, worship, praise to him uh, for all that he's done. He's worthy of our life, our complete devotion and allegiance. We pray, Lord Jesus, that we would follow and obey you. Help us to deny ourselves, take up our crosses, and follow you. Uh, bless us, Holy Spirit, with your wisdom, with your comfort, with your presence. As we are here in the word, gathered to know more about Christ and to become like him, bless us now as we walk through this text together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we've said, overall, what this text is trying to establish for us is that to be a disciple of Jesus means we give God allegiance above all else. That God is first in our lives. And with God first in our life, the way we make God first in our life is by becoming like God. Jesus, by following his example and his teachings and looking to him for the way we're to live. And so the first thing that this text points out, and we'll walk through it and I'll give you a few points, is that a disciple is to become like their teacher or master. Disciples become like their teacher, their master. This is what Jesus begins, as we read today, saying is that uh, a disciple is not above their teacher or their master. They're going to be like him, and in particular, like him in his suffering. So Luke 6, 4, 6, chapter 6, verse 40 has a similar saying, everyone who is fully trained 
will be like his teacher. That if you've been apprenticed, you've been trained, you've been taught, you, you're trying to emulate the example of your teacher. And Jesus says, look, I've been hated. I've been labeled by the religious leaders Beelzebul. Uh, and if I've been called this, you, my disciples, will also be maligned. You'll be abused. You'll be called names. You'll be mocked and blasphemed. Uh, and this title, Beelzebul, means master of the house. And it's a title that was used to refer to Satan, the devil, the prince of demons. And so Jesus is recognizing that the religious leaders have called him Beelzebul. They have said he only does his miracles by the power of Satan. By the power of the devil is how Jesus does these miraculous things. And what's uh, amazing about that is, is that they have looked at Jesus, the true Lord and master of all. And instead of recognizing him as God with them, they have blasphemously called him Satan. The Messiah is being rejected and called Satan by those who would call themselves the religious leaders of God's people. Uh, this is a shocking thing. And Jesus just says, um, if they've done this to me, they will do this and maybe other, other worse things to you as well as my disciples. And so what we need to recognize is that uh, as we follow Jesus, one of the things that may happen is the suffering we face may increase with our closeness to Christ. The closer we get to Jesus, the more we like, like him we become, the more likely it is that we will suffer as he did. And if you want to live a carefree and an uncommitted and a comfortable life, uh, let me just say to you, don't follow Jesus. Don't become his disciple if you want life uh, to be uh, carefree. Now, it'll be uh, life will become painful and dreadful and filled with suffering in other ways uh, if you don't follow Jesus. And there is an eternal suffering that will come if you don't follow Jesus. Uh, but at least in this life, you might be a little more comfortable. Things might go easier for you. You might not be rejected by family and friends. But if you follow Jesus and are committed to living his life and his teachings, um, things will be hard at times. And the question that we are all confronted with as we read this text, whether you claim to be a disciple or not, is that is do I really want to be like Christ? If this is what it means to be like Christ, do I want to be like him? Uh, it's nice to think I want to be like Christ when, when life is going well. I'm not facing opposition or persecution for obeying Jesus or talking about him. But, but will I want to be like Christ when everyone turns against him and against me? It's a question for all of us. Here's what Jesus will say now. Secondly, disciples fear only God, not humans. And, and in fact, disciples don't have to fear the things of this world or human threats or human violence. Why? Because we're called to fear and trust in God alone. Um, so three times Jesus will exhort the disciples in verses 26, 28, and 31. He will say in each of those passages, do not fear. Do not fear. Why? Well, why does Jesus need to say that? Well, he's warned them about the reality that they will be persecuted. They will be betrayed and handed over to rulers and authorities. Uh, they will be called names. They will be abused in other ways. Uh, there's, there's good reason that Jesus is going to have to, to tell his disciples, even though all this bad stuff is going to happen, don't be afraid. All those are pretty scary things. And Jesus gives us good reason that we should not be afraid. These are things that we all need to hear as disciples of Jesus. And so what does he say about why we shouldn't be afraid? Well, he points out that God will make everything hidden known. So Jesus will te teach his disciples some things in secret or some things privately. But Jesus says, you're going to take the message that I give you and you're going to speak it in the light. You're going to speak it boldly from the rooftops. You're going to pronounce this message publicly in a way that others will see it and hear it. And uh, even though you're going to do all this publicly and you're going to receive abuse and injustice and bad things are going to happen to you, don't worry about that. Don't be ashamed of me because God will make known every injustice that's been carried out against his disciples. And not only will those things come to the light, but they will also be dealt with. God will punish the evildoer and he will deliver his people. And so Jesus is trying to tell his disciples, we have nothing to be ashamed of. We have nothing to hide as followers of Jesus. Our loyalty, our faithfulness to Christ will be made known and it will be revealed on the day of Christ's return. When Jesus comes back, these 12 and all those others throughout history who have followed Jesus faithfully, it will be revealed to the entire world, to every human being who has ever lived, that Jesus truly is the Messiah, the Lord and Savior of the world. And God is promising that patience and perseverance will be seen and rewarded on the day of Christ's return.
you know, Paul will write about this, this way that Jesus in Philippians 2, he's, he'll say, talk about Jesus' incarnation, his humbling himself to the point of death on the cross, his resurrection and exaltation to the right hand of God, and the promise of his coming again. And, he, and Paul says about his coming again, that on that day, every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's a day coming where it will be made known to the whole world that Jesus is Lord. And so if you go through your life today feeling rejected, feeling abandoned, feeling mocked by those because you follow Jesus and they don't think it's real or they don't think it's true, know that a day is coming where everything will be made known, where God will reward your trust in Jesus, your willingness to follow and obey his teaching. And here's, this, here's another reason they shouldn't be afraid. He says, you shouldn't fear those who can kill the body but can't kill the soul. You know, there, there are a lot of human beings who would face Christians and want to put them to death. And in fact, our brothers and sisters around the world, we need to be praying for them because there are many who are being put to death for their faith in Christ Jesus. And uh, in spite of that, God says to us through Jesus, don't be afraid of those people because all they can do is kill you, all right? Now, if we are in Christ, we have already died with him in our baptism. We've been buried and we've been raised to walk in newness of life. And we've been promised the resurrection of Jesus has happened and our resurrection will happen on the day of Christ's return. And so those who can kill the body cannot kill the soul. They cannot kill our resurrection hope because God will raise us up just as he raised Jesus from the dead. And in fact, I, I understand this text to be saying that here's what you should fear. You should fear the one who has the power to destroy both soul and body in hell. Well, who's that referring to? I think that's referring to God, that God is the one who has our eternity in his power and in his hands, that he is the true and living judge uh, who will uh, reward us for what we have done in the body, whether good or evil. In fact, Proverbs 9 says, says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so God is the one with complete authority over our eternity, over our future resurrection, whether it be a resurrection to life or a resurrection to death. And so God is the one who we should fear, the one who we should live for and die for and serve, uh, not anybody else. And so what I would encourage you, what Jesus is trying to decide, encourage these disciples to realize is that they need to take the long view, right? If you ever had somebody tech tell you to take the long views, don't don't get so just down or discouraged about just what you're going through right now, because, you know, there's something better coming. And Jesus is trying to say, take the eternal view. Take the view that says, uh, I can suffer in this life for Jesus because I know there's an eternity coming where God will raise his people up and save them from the power of sin and death and save them from evil, save them, vindicate them for their righteous lives and trusting in Jesus. And um, on the other hand, I don't want to be a part of the people. I, I fear the reality of God's coming judgment. I fear an eternity uh, of suffering in hell after the resurrection. And so I would rather serve God now and suffer for his name than be separated from God for eternity and suffer under his judgment. And so uh, God is, is telling us that it is better to live with Christ and to die with Christ. Uh, this is what Paul says. Paul in uh, Philippians chapter one, when he's imprisoned and he, he knows there's a possibility that he could die for his faith. Uh, he gives us this meditation for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. And, and Paul goes on to say, I don't know which I'd rather have. If I keep living, I can continue to minister to God's people and proclaim the gospel to people that don't yet know Christ. Uh, but if I die, I'll be with the Lord and I'll be waiting in a place of joy and peace for the resurrection from the dead. And either way, I'm content with whatever happens to me, because if I live, it's Christ. If I die, it's gain because I'm with Christ. Either way, Paul's content with that. And, and the question for us is, can we be content with following Jesus in life and in death, no matter what comes? And this is what God will say near the end of the section is that uh, those who acknowledge the name of Jesus before others, Jesus says, I will acknowledge your name before my father. You own me in public. I'll own you before my father. You be not ashamed of me in front of others, and I won't be ashamed of you in front of my father. Uh, I will publicly proclaim your name if you proclaim mine. And in fact, this is a part of Christian discipleship is that we confess the name of Jesus. In Romans 1, 16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul is, is a public proclaimer of the gospel. I'm not ashamed. 
He's not ashamed to belong to Jesus and to tell other people he belongs to Jesus, whether they be Jew or Gentile, because he knows the gospel is the only thing with the power to save them, to save us. Later in that same book, in Romans 10, 9, Paul will, says, will say, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That part of our becoming Christians is confessing Jesus is the Lord and believing that he was raised bodily from the dead. And so the question for all of us in this is, do people in your life, do people at work, do people at school, do the people that you uh, recreate with, do the people in your neighborhood, do the people in your, who are your family, your friends, do they know that you are a disciple of Jesus? Now, that doesn't mean that you shove it in their face in an ugly way. That doesn't mean that you... Um, uh, just just become a terrible person <laughs> in the way you represent Christ. Uh, but but do you, in, in small ways even, acknowledge Jesus is the one who's directing the way you are living your life, that you are committed to his word and his teaching. You're committed to living, following his example. Um, and we can do that in kind and loving and gracious ways. We can talk to others about our willingness that we follow Christ and he's Lord of all. Uh, and, and the question for us is, uh, would people be surprised to know that you're a Christian? Would people be surprised to know that you carry the name of Christ with you? Uh, and if they would be, there's something in that you might want to look at, I might want to look at and say, what? It, why am I ashamed to let others know that I'm a disciple of Christ? Uh, why am I afraid? And so, uh, will you identify with Jesus? Number three, disciples are valued greatly by God the Father. This is another reason why Jesus will say, don't fear. You are greatly valued by God the Father. And he uses language reminiscent of the Sermon on the Mount, right? That in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about this God uh, who cares for his creation, this God who provides for his children what they need, food and clothing, uh, that this God is a good father who will take care of his children, that uh, those children who ask, the father gives good things to those who ask him. And here again, Jesus is giving us these earthly illustrations that help us see God's care for us as his people. He talks about uh, a sparrow. Uh, let me read that section again, just in case you've forgotten it. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. And, and this is a helpful illustration. What, what you need to know about a sparrow is, is in Jesus' day and time, sparrows were customarily thought of as uh, some of the smallest of creatures, smallest of birds. And the penny is, it would have been, uh, it's, it's in Greek, it's the word Assyrian. Uh, the Roman, it's a Roman copper coin uh, that would be a, in Latin have been a, called a, a quadrans. And this was the smallest of coins. Uh, and it was worth about a 16th of a denarius. And a denarius is, is a Roman coin. And it's what the typical day laborer would be paid at the, for a day's work. And so uh, think of a 16th value of a day's work. And uh, so people would take one of these little, little pennies, little coins, uh, quadrans, and uh, they could buy two sparrows. Uh, these, this was food often for very poor people. Uh, and what Jesus is saying is uh, that if God, God cares about the most little of birds that are sold for just a little bit of money, and you, you can buy two sparrows for one little coin. And if God cares about those birds and, it, and God is even present and cares about when those birds fall from the sky and fall to the ground and die, if God cares about that little bitty sparrow, think much more how much God loves and cares for his children, his people. And Jesus says, you don't have to be afraid because you are of greater value than many sparrows. Uh, in fact, he says, God knows you so intimately in such a detailed way that he's even counted the number of hairs on your head, right? Amazing. God knows you down to the smallest detail, and God cares for you, and God will not abandon his disciples who suffer and even die for the name of Jesus. But God knows, God cares, and God will take care of us. He loves us. Number four, he calls us to this. Disciples give allegiance to God over all loyalties, even family. And this one would have been especially hard 
for the disciples of Jesus' day and for many people that live in cultures where family uh, and the greater culture, the greater group is more important than the individual. Uh, you are expected to give your greatest loyalty to your family, to the group. Uh, not just to your individual desires or wants. And so Jesus speaks into a time and place where most people uh, were expected to honor their father and mother, to care for their broader family, to put the family's interests above their own. And now Jesus is calling them to, uh, to still love their families, but to say, you must love God more than you love your families. You must love Jesus more than you love your families. And if your family is standing in the way of you following me, you must follow me, even if it means being rejected by your family. Jesus recognizes that the gospel is like a sword that brings division between family members, between fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, uh, in-laws and their uh, daughter-in-law or son-in-law, uh, brothers and sisters, that, that there is a reality that when we obey the gospel and we follow Jesus, not everyone in our family will agree with us. Not everyone will continue to receive us or love us. We may be rejected by those who we've been cl most closely related to. Uh, and Jesus is actually quoting from a text in the book of Micah. He quotes from Micah chapter 7, and I'm going to read this. In this section, Micah is lamenting the state of Israel and how no one is faithful to the covenant and no one is faithful to one another. Uh, and so he says in verses 5 through 7 of Micah chapter 7, Put no trust in a neighbor. Have no confidence in a friend. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your arms. For the son treats the father with contempt. The daughter rises up against her mother. mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. But as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. So Micah is looking at his, his people, Israel in his own day as a prophet. And he's saying, you can't trust anybody. Uh, no one is faithful to the covenant of Yahweh. No one's faithful to do righteousness and justice to one another. Um, I'm trying to follow God, but, but I can't trust anyone. And that's a reason to lament, right? That's heartbreaking. But Micah's uh, final answer is, I can't trust anybody else, but I will put my trust in God alone and he will be my salvation and my deliverance. And this is what Jesus is calling his disciples to do. Put your trust in God alone. Let him be your salvation and your deliverance in your life, even if others turn against you for following him. And so what we need to be reminded of is that Jesus takes greater priority than our family, our friends, than our hobbies, greater priority than anything else in life. Jesus deserves our allegiance. And what we recognize is if your family abandons you, you will be welcomed into Jesus' household. God's family will not forsake you or abandon you, but they will welcome you and care for you if you will follow Jesus. You know, this is the reality that um, maybe you as a disciple living in North America have experienced this, but I know our brothers and sisters living in places like India, Pakistan, China, the Middle East, and other parts of the world. Often, if they come from families of various religious backgrounds and they make the decision to become public disciples of Jesus, to be baptized and to become, become a part of local churches, so many people have experienced rejection by their own families. It is not an uncommon story to hear of when Hindus in India leave their faith behind and become disciples of Jesus for their family to disown them, to put them out of their house, uh, to reject them, not allow them to have work, uh, to physically assault, beat, kill that person for following Jesus. It is a truly a, a real commitment to be obedient to Christ in these places. For Muslims who decide to follow Jesus, very similar things happen. Uh, their whole life can be turned upside down by because their family will reject them if they have rejected their faith. Uh, in China, for many people who claim to follow Jesus, it, it is a hard thing. And, uh, you know, thankfully, the gospel is flourishing in all these different places, even where there's great persecution. Uh, house churches are growing and multiplying in places like China and in the Middle East, where people uh, have to be careful about how they proclaim their faith and when, where and when they can share it. Uh, and, and their example calls us higher in a place where we have freedoms to be able to proclaim the good news and live faithful lives for Christ in the public square, for the most part, without fear of physical persecution, is that we are called higher to proclaim that Jesus is Lord and to lay down our lives for his kingdom and to pray for those who are dying for the sake of Christ. Uh, the metaphor of carrying the cross reveals this vision of discipleship as a path to death 
right? Uh, carrying one's cross was what Rome forced uh, those criminals who were going to be executed to do. Jesus will have to literally carry his own cross until he is no longer physically able to do it. And then someone else will carry it the rest of the way for him. Um, and so when the disciples heard these words, we have to imagine that they they felt a shiver down their spines. They they probably sat up a little straighter and said, oh, um, this really could lead to our death if we take Jesus seriously. And what Jesus is foreshadowing is his own coming death. And he's telling them, this is what it means to be my disciple, that a disciple must deny himself. We die to our self-will. We take up our cross. We embrace God's will, no matter what the cost. And we follow Christ wherever he leads and whatever he calls us to do. And Jesus gives this paradoxical saying that if you find your life now, you will lose it. But if you lose your life now for Christ's sake, for the kingdom, you will find it in the end. So if you um, if you refuse to submit to Jesus as Lord and his call to discipleship, in the end, you will lose your life. But if you are willing to deny yourself and lose your life for the sake of Jesus and his kingdom now, your life will be restored. It will be found in the end, the day of the resurrection. Here's the truth. We don't find our life by giving our allegiances to worldly values and things. You don't find your life by pursuing pleasure. If that's your highest priority, you will not find life. You will only find death. Now, God has created a good world that we are able to enjoy as it points us back to worshiping and devoting ourselves to Jesus and to God. Um, but it's not worth devoting your life to. If your life's devotion is possessions, gaining more stuff, this is not the path to life. It will not deliver you. If your life's allegiance is to power, to gaining control and power over yourself or over your life or over others, um, you will not find life. Life is not in claiming power. It's in laying down our power in submission to Jesus. And if your life is about finding security or finding protection, um, the only true security is found in King Jesus, and it's found no one else, nowhere else. So lay down your life for Jesus, and you will receive it again. And here's the last word of encouragement that Jesus gives, is that anyone who welcomes you, my messengers, my representatives, welcomes me. Uh, the person who welcomes a prophet, a righteous person, a little one, a way of referring to the disciples of Jesus, and often to the most vulnerable of Jesus' disciples, those who seem to have little status or value in the world, that those who welcome disciples of Jesus, who even give them a cold, cold cup of water in Jesus' name, that they will receive salvation. They will be blessed by God as well. Um, because when you welcome those who represent Jesus, you're welcoming Jesus and God who sent him. And so God will reward those who welcome and receive the messengers of the gospel. Here's what we are being called to commit ourselves to, is allegiance to God above all. In the Torah, Yahweh commands Israel that you shall have no other gods before me. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Is that above everything else comes God. And idolatry is at its root about competing allegiances. That the reason Israel was condemned by God when they worshipped other gods is because they were uh, giving their allegiance to different gods or different beings or to different uh, things. And so often we do the same. You might not have a statue, but all of us are guilty of having given our allegiance and our trust to different idols, to different things, whether it be power or pleasure or protection, whatever it may be, possessions. We are all being called to say, is Jesus the one I give my allegiance to? And in fact, this is what Matthew is saying, and, and I want to read us one more passage of Scripture, and then we'll take communion. In the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verses 17 through 4, 1, uh, Paul writes these words, calling us to remember our allegiances to the kingdom of God. Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, Stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Paul's admonition is very similar. Follow the example of people who are following Jesus, who are imitating him. 
Don't follow the example of those who are now enemies of the cross and whose minds and hopes are set on worldly things, but trust that you are a citizenship, a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And the Lord Jesus will come again and he will raise us and change us. He will give us a life eternal. Put your hope and trust in the Lord. Stand firm in him, my beloved. Walk with Christ. What is most important to you? Is it God and his kingdom or is it other things? Today is a day of decision for all of us. Every day is a day of decision to make Jesus first above all. Let's take communion. And as we uh, take the bread and drink the cup, let's be reminded that as we take these symbolic uh, means of remembering Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, that we have been given an opportunity to commit ourselves to Jesus again and remind ourselves that he is worthy of our whole life. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for Jesus, our Lord, who gave his body on the cross. We pray that we would become like our master, our teacher, even if it means suffering, when it means suffering. We pray, Lord, that we would be willing to deny ourselves and take up our crosses and follow him. Lord, remove from us any fear of man and what man can do to us, and instead give us greater hope in the gospel, in the promise of your saving power, your love, your coming resurrection at Christ's return. Uh, Lord, we just ask that you would help us to love you more than anything else. Bless us now as we take the bread together and remember Jesus' death on the cross. We pray in his name. Amen. Well, I dropped my communion. I'll have to take it in a minute. Let's also pray for the cup. Uh, God, we thank you for the blood of Jesus who shed his precious blood on the cross for our sins. Uh, Lord, we ask that you be with Jesus. Uh, be with us as we remember Jesus. Uh, help us to honor him as we drink the cup, to remember his sacrificial life given for ours. Uh, Lord, we know that it is hard to follow you in a fallen world. We know that we are often afraid, and yet we ask that you relieve our fears and that you give us greater hope in the gospel. Bless us now as we drink the cup together, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Again, let me say thank you for joining me. I hope that as you go out this week and as you go about your work, as you talk to your family and friends, as you uh, enjoy your recreation, whatever it may be, uh, that you model for others that your allegiance is to Jesus above all, to God above all. And if they could see that in you, that you're willing to go the distance and fall in Christ. Thanks for being with me. We love you. God bless you. Uh, please feel free to leave a comment. Send us a message on Facebook or through our Ritual Church of Christ website. You can send us an email there. Let us know uh, what's going on in your life and how we might connect with you. We love you. God bless you. Bye.